Robert McNeil, MBE, is the ambassador for Remembering Srebrenica and is an UNESCO RILA affiliate artist. Robert joined the first of many international forensic teams to gather evidence of war crimes in Bosnia that would result in putting the perpetrators behind bars. He has since felt compelled to depict his experience through original artwork, which details his time in Bosnia and Kosovo, presenting loss, grief, and the challenging scientific processes involved in conflict zones. From 1996 until 2009, Robert was invited to form part of the national and international forensic team who were tasked with, tasked with providing physical and scientific evidence of terrorist attacks in the UK and Ireland, crimes against humanity and genocide in the war zones in the Balkans and in Africa. And he also assisted in the identification of British and Australian soldiers killed in France during World War I and victims of the South East Asia tsunami in Thailand, in, in Thailand. Robert retired in 2009, though having seen all the work that Robert's done, I don't think retirement really comes into it. Um, and the title of the talk he, he will be giving tonight is Assembling Stories from the Grave. It's an honour to have you with us, Robert, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Um, I'd like to thank you and Interfaith Scotland for inviting me to take part in today's 26th anniversary of the genocide of Muslims from Srebrenica. It's also an honour to be part of the Scottish launch of Anne and Hassan's powerful book, Voices of Srebrenica. Um, it's a beautiful book, uh, a beautifully and very sensitively written. And for anyone who wants to know anything about what happened at that tragic time, uh, I, I would strongly recommend it. Um, my, my journey to Bosnia began uh, in 1996, um, months after Hassan had survived the death march through the forest from Srebrenica to Tuzla. And I would like to share that journey with you. However, uh, beforehand, I should tell you a wee bit about my background. Uh, for almost 30 years, <coughs> excuse me, I had worked managing mortuaries in Glasgow. Um, uh, my training was assisting pathologists when they carried out autopsies uh, on people who had died in unexpected, unexpected or unexplained circumstances, um, uh, mostly from natural causes, but uh, sometimes uh, I dealt with murders and, and suicides. And so in, in the spring of 1996, I was contacted by a charity called Physicians for Human Rights, who had been asked by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, to take a, a team of forensic specialists out to Bosnia um, uh, near the Srebrenica area where they, through aerial photography, they had discovered um, signs of what they believed were mass graves. Um, and our job was to go there um, and examine those bodies and gather evidence that might help in the prosecutions of the perpetrators. So uh, I travelled along with a pathologist from Edinburgh um, to the, the, the town of Tuzla, uh, itself a town that was badly damaged uh, and its people by the, the war. Uh, and we were taken there to um, a hastily built or uh, uh, erected mortuary which was in fact um, a garment store, a former garment store that had been badly bomb damaged. And so a space was cleared in the floor uh, to allow us to carry out the um, examinations of the body. It was, it was a terrible place actually. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, they were just cleared, a, cleared rubble from the floor to, 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 uh, to allow us to work there. Uh, there was no water uh, for anyone in the area, actually, uh, and electri electricity was, was, was sporadic. We believed at the time that um, following the signing of the Dayton Agreement, 
uh, that the war had ended. But um, near where we were, there was there was still fighting uh, occasionally erupting, and what we hadn't realised that we might be a target for people who would want to disrupt the work that we were doing. Um, and indeed, uh, there were occasions where we had to evacuate the mortuary for our own safety um, uh, until the threats were over. And so it was a difficult place to work in. When the, the bodies, um, and I believe the bodies came from the first graves that we had worked on from Serska, um, the, the bodies uh, arrived in a, a pretty terrible condition. Uh, they had been in the ground for some months um, but what was shocking, I guess, to the team was how those victims uh, had been dealt with, how they had uh, reached their deaths. Many of them had been beaten, clubbed, stabbed, and then shot um, and thrown into the mass graves. And we, 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 we quickly noticed that many of the men uh, and young men, teenagers, had been um, blindfolded and had their hands tied behind their backs and um, but it was part of my job to help record those injuries and it, it was quite a traumatic experience but because of the disruptions um, not just by threats but the, the, there was great media uh, attention there and we often had to stop work to deal with with them and so when my time came up after about four or five weeks there uh, it was time for me to re return home to my own job. And, um, but I felt when I got home that uh, I'd hardly done very much there, really, that the, the, the we were overwhelmed by, by bodies. And it's important to say that pathologists, when they carry out autopsies, uh, are very used to doing very highly detailed and meticulous examinations. And, uh, and that's vitally important when it comes to trials, because... Um, any mistakes they make or any shortcuts they take uh, would be quickly picked up by uh, by defence councils and uh, trials could collapse as a result of that. So it was a very, very slow process. And as I say, um, I felt I hadn't done very much. So in 1997, the, the following year, um, I was asked to return to Bosnia, which I, I, I immediately agreed to. But this time they had learned some, or the UN had learned some lessons about how to deal with this. And um, a purpose-built mortuary had been set up. It was in the process of completion in the town of Visoko, uh, which was in central, was in central Bosnia. Um, and it was a much safer place to work. And it was a great place really from the point of view of carrying out the work. Everything that we needed was supplied and the place was run by a man called Azmir Hodic, the director of the cemetery there, and he provided us with, with everything that we needed. Um, and so we were ready to start, start work on um, working with the, the victims from Srebrenica again, when instead we were told that, um, that uh, a, a commander of Luka camp, um, a military commander of a camp in Luka um, near Bershko, uh, had, there was a sealed indictment against this man and the ICTY wanted to arrest him and try him for crimes against humanity and uh, they badly needed, quickly needed evidence. So um, the Srebrenica um, victims sadly had to wait uh, until we dealt with, with those bodies. There were around 25 of them and that took us uh, a couple of weeks to, to, to deal with, with them. And just as we were about, after finish, completing that job, we were just about to start again, when we learned that a helicopter had crashed in the hill, surrounding hills. And this was uh, a, a UN helicopter that had um, 12 high profile diplomats on board who were all killed. And um, the, there was a question as whether or not that helicopter had been brought down or whether it was just a tragic accident. So once again, we were held up when we had to deal with identifying those victims because Kofi Annan, um, the, the UN Secretary Ge um, General, had uh, insisted that those men be returned, be identified and returned to their, their families back home from different parts of, of the world, America, Germany, Poland and, and the UK. Um, and so finally, we managed to start work. Um, time was running out, but we managed to start work again on the Srebrenica bodies. 
And as we were doing so, we learned of something that was um, awful. It was really quite devastating for the families uh, of those who had died in Srebrenica. Um, and that was that we were told that the primary graves that were being discovered uh, had been re-entered, the bodies disinterred, and then cruelly torn apart by uh, using mechanical diggers, etc. Um, and the bodies taken and dispersed among hundreds of many mass, other mass graves and further into Republika Srpska. And, uh, and those places often were very difficult to find. Um, from our point of view, what we thought would be a task that would last just a few years um, turned out not to be the case. Instead of the eight and a half thousand or so victims from Srebrenica, that turned into over 17,000 body parts that um, we were expected to try and put together again uh, uh, to try and um, return them with some dignity to the families who were desperate for news of them. And so um, we carried on with the work for a few more weeks before once again um, I, I returned home. However, by 1998, when I returned once again, um, things had changed. I think what had happened to the victims from Srebrenica really gave a wake-up call to the authorities in the West. And um, ICTY then um, extremely improved the, the work that we were doing in Visoko by expanding the mortuary to almost twice the size three times the number of forensic experts uh, started arriving from every corner of the world. And, um, and to be honest, I was quite, uh, quite pleased at, at last that we were getting somewhere with those bodies. And um, ICMP, the, the International Commission, Commission in Missing Persons, they were taking charge to some extent now as well by being able to um, uh, uh, through gold standard techniques and DNA matching, being able to identify bodies. And so at last, um, some of the victims' families were getting at last some relief by being able to bury their loved ones with some dignity and respect. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and so uh, w the work there went on throughout that year almost until um, it had to stop again because of winter and so on. We were aware when, in 1998 that there was um, activity going on in Kosovo. <clears throat> Excuse me. Milosevic had started his fourth failed war in Kosovo. Um, and this time, instead of waiting to what happened in Srebrenica, the, the, the NATO authorities decided that they would bomb Belgrade and Kosovo and bomb the Serbs out of that country. And, uh, instead of being sent straight back to Srebre uh, to uh, Visako, uh, I was sent instead to Kosovo, and that's another story. It would take too long to to go into that, but that too is an important story. So uh, I also went out for a while to Croatia and dealt with Serbian victims this time before returning shortly before returning to um, to Visako. So. Um, by 2020, uh, I'm coming to an uh, end. Um, by 2020, um, uh, I returned to Visoko, uh, and this time um, the bodies that we were dealing with were from the Priador area, uh, and in particular from Omarska camp, a notorious concentration camp there. And once again, like Kosovo, I don't want to pay a disservice to that story because it's it's an important and massive story, in particular what happened uh, to women and men there who were sexually uh, abused to the, the the most horrend in the most horrendous way. So I returned to Vis Visoko for a few more weeks before leaving that that work um, to go on to do other um, uh, other jobs uh, at different parts of the world that Ma Maureen alluded to. However. Um, I retired, as Maureen said, in, 20, in 2009, and in 2014, uh, I learned of a charity, Remembering Srebrenica, founded by Dr. Wakar Azmir, uh, Dr. 
as me, I beg your pardon. Um, and um, I was really quite, quite thrilled when I read about the work that they were doing because uh, people in this country, I think, either weren't interested or had forgotten about what happened in, in Bosnia. Um, and I thought this was a great opportunity for me um, to help support them. And, um, and so in 2014, I was asked to go out on a delegation um, uh, of educators to, to, uh, to, to Bosnia. And we traveled to, to Srebrenica, to Potocari, to the memorial there. Uh, and that was where I met Hassan for the first time. Uh, I also uh, met met um, with Nejad Avdic, Avdic and three of the mothers from from Srebrenica, who I noticed when when telling their story, um, a profound sadness in their eyes, really, and uh, and that to me was very moving. It even occurred to me at some points that perhaps their loved ones had gone through our hands uh, in in Visoko, and so. Um, it wasn't until I walked over to the um, to the beautiful cemetery across the road from the memorial um, and noticed for the first time all of the names of the victims carved on the the, the, the stone uh, 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 stone there and um, it suddenly struck me that I had only known these victims by numbers, by impersonal grave numbers that stayed with them throughout the t all those years and kept returning to them when more of their body parts were found. And I found it profoundly beautiful to see those names uh, on, on those, those, not only on the gravestones, but on that memorial stone. Um, and that meant a great deal to me, so much so that I took another delegation of forensic people over there who hadn't who hadn't visited there and I'll end this by saying that um, one thing that that uh, now I go into schools and uh, spend a lot of my time and talking to people trying to tell people what happened in in Srebrenica and other parts of Bosnia um, and I haven't personally encountered much denial but I know that it goes on a lot especially in Bosnia and what I would end by saying is that there were, uh, all, all I can say is that there were experts from 32 countries around the world, including some from Serbia, who carried out this work diligently, gave up their comfortable lives to go there and continue this work. And I would say to the deniers, surely they can all be wrong. Thank you. Robert, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. And also thank you for the really important work that you have done. I know that you are so deeply moved by everything that you experienced, that you have expressed um, some, of, some of that emotion in your art. And with your permission, I would like to share a couple of the beautiful paintings that you've done. And maybe you'd like to say a couple of words okay. um, about, about that process. Um, this is this is a, a painting uh, I did um, inspired by Hassan, I must say, and other survivors who uh, who ran into the forest to try and escape escape certain death, and um, uh, uh, and these were the men who uh, who when they ran into the forest had uh, were, were uh, had were bombed, were sniped at, were ambushed, and uh, uh, were forced to surrender. Um, and the, 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 the man in the front is, is really praying um, to, to his God uh, for guidance in that because many men, as I say, handed them up, oh, sometimes where the Serbian soldiers were wearing UN uniforms to entice the men uh, to, to come down from the, the forest. And, uh, and uh, as we've said, over 8,000 did and were summarily executed and um, this painting, I think, um, for me anyway, reminded me of, of that horrible event. And this one, um, these two paintings are from a series called Dark Bosnia, which uh, was exhibited online and is available if anyone wants to look at it. 
And this painting is more, more symbolic. It's uh, a candle um, sitting on top of a Muslim prayer mat. Um, you'll notice that the candle has been snuffed out and that symbolizes um, sudden death. And so the, the, the smoke has turned and transformed into the figures from uh, from the, the mass graves and uh, I, I did have an opportunity to see a mass grave right at the beginning and it's an image that's been seared in my mind and will do forever, I guess. Robert, thank you. They're really, really um, beautiful paintings and um, I think you've really captured the, I mean, the theme and the, the, the challenge um, of everything that you've witnessed and that you that you have also 